From CBS News in New York, this is Up to the Minute. I'm Nanette Hansen. And I'm Troy Roberts. Thanks for joining us this morning. Here's what's happening. Exhausted rescuers in Japan are now in their fifth consecutive day of searching for earthquake victims. The death toll has topped now 4,000, and there are still hundreds of people missing and unaccounted for. The scene in Kobe, the hardest hit city, is still one of rubble and destruction. Steve Herman reports now from Kobe. The constant sounds in Kobe are helicopters dropping off food and the klaxons of ambulances and other emergency vehicles. Amid the noises of rescue and relief are sounds that will be heard here for a long time. Drills, jackhammers and shovels signifying the initial attempts at reconstruction. While thousands of survivors stream out of the city, thousands more are coming in. Besides the troops of soldiers, journalists, and utility repairmen, are scientists and engineers from around the world. They say a quake of this magnitude in an urban area will provide valuable lessons. I think you learn from all incidents like this, and this incident here will help uh, you know, the rest of Japan uh, modernize from an earthquake standpoint, will help us in the United States and or any other areas that uh, have earthquakes, because we'll all you know, learn and improve from you know, the incident here. It may take only days to repave the minor cracks in the road and clean up all the debris along the sidewalks in the Civic Center, but as far as fixing all the expressway overpasses and getting all the commuter lines running to get life back to normal in Kobe, the experts are saying that will take years and billions of dollars. Steve Herman for CBS News, Kobe. Asia Now, Steve Herman has a story from the British colony. The sound of gunshots, the sight of heavy weaponry, and the feeling that Hong Kong is no longer one of Asia's safest cities has permeated the British colony. Scenes like these have become more common on the evening newscasts here, as Hong Kong witnesses an unprecedented wave of robbery, shootouts, and car thefts. There's a common link connecting these high-profile crimes. It's China. The authorities and the crime reporters trace the crooks, the outlet for their ill-gotten goods, and even their weapons to the other side of the border. We've had grenades, AK-47s, uh, machine pistols from, from Poland and from uh, Italy. But these are all weapons that are being brought in by mainlanders, where they're cheap. Uh, and usually the weapons are taken out with them when they go. Um, the police, I mean, they don't really want to upgrade their weaponry, because if they upgrade their weaponry, then the other guys are going to upgrade that. And before you know it, it's going to be, you know, gun battles on the street all day, uh, and a lot of people could get hurt. A lot of people have been getting hurt and killed, including bystanders who get in the way during jewelry store robberies. But the more likely victims are the many thousands of Hong Kong residents who drive luxury cars. While thieves haven't yet resorted to American-style carjackings, they have developed a quick and sophisticated method of stealing vehicles and getting them on their way to China in mere minutes, using high-powered speedboats known as big flyers or daifeis. Once a loading site has been selected, and these loading sites will only be selected at the last minute, uh, they will have teams on land to make sure there are no police in the vicinity. Uh, and then when the site has been selected, the daifei will be called in the car will be driven to the location uh, and an excavator or some other type of crane truck will be used to transfer the, the vehicle onto the daifei uh, and that can be done in, in less than a minute. Police maintain they're doing all they can with the resources available, yet they seem virtually helpless to nab the fast-moving car thieves. However, they have stepped up their visibility around banks and jewelry stores in an effort to curtail the rash of daring daylight robberies. <laughs> These kinds of things are happening everywhere, but here there are many new immigrants coming in from China who are seeking work. Then you've also got the triads which are growing at a very fast rate. They're hiring the mainlanders to come and commit these crimes, and it's all really leading to a deterioration of the social order. That's being blamed on Hong Kong's approaching return to Chinese control in 1997. Observers say the uncertainty around the transfer of power is also demoralizing police officers now working for the British. And there's also problems about what's going to be done with them. Are they going to be victimized by the Chinese authorities when they take over? So morale is, is, is a big problem. Um, also, the lack of growth within the civil service and 
therefore within the police, means that they don't have enough manpower on the streets, really. While corruption on the force is visibly less than it used to be, there are those who contend that officers no longer are as aggressive as they once were about intelligence, including paying informants. I think the police um, got enough money, you know, for information, I think so, you know. Before, the uh, police uh, department got a lot of information, you know, information about the, if you get in information, the police get you money. But, but now I don't think so he get enough money for information, you know. There's little information, but a lot of speculation about what the shape of law enforcement will be after 1997 under the Chinese. Police across the border are considered more ruthless, but also more corrupt. For those here worried about what kind of society Hong Kong will be for their children, the recent bloodshed in the streets is one more incentive to buy a one-way ticket out to safety. Steve Herman, Asia Now, Hong Kong. And as Asia Now, Steve Herman reports from Manila, since there is little room for compromise, relations between the government and the church are getting worse by the day. The battle between church and state focuses on families like this one. Aling Floor has had 11 children. The state says the experience of Mrs. Floor and millions of other women shows that natural family planning is unreliable. The church insists that when it doesn't work, contraception or abortion are not alternatives. There's the old saying, go forth and multiply. That's what I follow. The population of the Philippines was under 15 million before World War II. It's now about 63 million, and the country has the highest birth rate in the region. Yet the Catholic Church sees the devoutly religious country as its last big platform for its teachings on contraception. And we have the feeling that we are the last of the Mohicans, you know, that we are the last country to fight this thing. And we feel that it is at minimum, this population, cam the campaign to control population is at minimum a mistake and at maximum diabolic. The church and state enjoyed a cozy relationship under the previous administration. After all, it was the Catholic Church that helped to topple the Marcos dictatorship and bring Corazon Aquino to power. But that close bond has been severed now, early in the first term of the Philippines' first non-Catholic president. The facts uh, speak for themselves. That obviously is a factor. Uh, the president's lack of understanding of uh, uh, the principles of moral law and uh, the constant teaching of the Catholic Church on this issue based on moral law. In an effort to boost the use of birth control, other lawmakers are pushing for establishing a national population policy and appointing a family planning czar for the country. A bill to that effect has been introduced by the Protestant senator who happens to be the sister of the president. Many of those who use uh, artificial methods are good Catholics, you know, are pious Catholics uh, who, uh, who want uh, to um, raise uh, healthy, uh, well-educated children. There are also many nuns and priests, especially if you go to the uh, smaller towns and villages, who have seen the awful conditions of poverty under which uh, some Filipinos live. Now, they are for helping the poor. They are for family planning. There are those in the church, both clergy and lay members, who point the finger of blame for all of this at Washington. They say the whole campaign is being funded to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars by the U.S. Agency for International Development. It is part of the United States campaign for control abroad and for power abroad to cut down the population of the Asian countries. My funding source came after I determined what I was going to do. That's my only answer. I'm not denying that there is no foreign funding, but to say that these foreign funders are dictating to me what to do, no, sir. Dr. Flavier, one of the most loved public figures in the Philippines, is also not about to let the church dictate to him or the women of the country birth control policy. For the women, you are like my daughter. Don't let any man, priest or doctor or me, to dictate to you what you should do with your bodies. Your body is yours. You determine when you are going to have your baby and your health is my concern and the health of your baby. That's my stand. So. They're going to teach not your family planning, 
wonderful. They're going to block information. Aha, that's different. That is censorship. The government's information on birth control is being disseminated by its legion of a half million health care workers, most of whom are Catholic. I don't think uh, every word of the church you know, should be uh, taken as, uh, as a commandment. So it's really up to the individual. But the church demands that it's up to the Vatican, not the individual. The way of controlling population by artificial contraception, by sterilization, and by abortion is wrong. That's what we believe, and we're going to fight for it. We're going to fight for it. And we just hope that we start a wave of resistance all through Asia, all through the Third World, and even in the United States and Europe. Full and unimpeded but the government contends that the crusade is of little direct help to the 13-member Floor family and millions of others like them who find themselves in a losing battle to share limited resources of food, housing, and education. Steve Herman, Asia Now, Manila. Treating valued clients to a geisha party used to be a traditional part of doing business for Japan's top companies. But since the collapse of the bubble economy, such events have become rarer. Even many of the biggest firms are no longer willing or able to pay top yen for the best of the nightlife. We still offer bottles of champagne for $1,500 and $6,000 brandies, but customers won't buy them now. But while customers pay less, they expect more from their kimono-clad hostesses. It's very important for them to be able to speak foreign languages and to know how to golf. Many of the girls here, as well as myself, go golfing with customers. It's a different feeling on the greens. They enjoy seeing a different side of us, and we get invited often. Of course, it's also a good place to find new customers. The remaining posh clubs of the Ginza, Akasaka, and Roppongi districts of Tokyo, struggling to survive in the post-bubble era, are finding that they can no longer depend on a few select company expense accounts. It used to be very common around here for prospective customers walking through the door to hear the phrase, Ichigen-san o kotowari, meaning, sorry, no first-timers. Many other clubs in this area were severely hurt by the collapse of the bubble economy, so they had to change that policy. But we are an exclusive members club, and we intend to remain so. Exclusive clubs, which have managed to maintain their loyal select clients, are finding not only do they show up less often or are more frugal, but they leave earlier and depart in a less ostentatious manner. They never call Rimo anymore. They call taxi. And people who call taxi, they are walking, you know, or catch, try to catch the last uh, train, I mean, metro. So they go home like 11 something. That's prompted across the board cuts in staff, salaries, and prices. Competition for hostess jobs has intensified. Foreign women from countries with weaker currencies are competing for yen paychecks against Japanese women, forced out of other jobs by the bubble's collapse. I didn't have many choice to go other field to find my job. And one of my friends suggested me to work here, and I came here, and I liked it. This out of my friend. I like the people who works here. So I start working here. Some clubs are advertising something they've never trumpeted before, low prices. Like uh, during the bubble era, if we keep charging ridiculous, ridiculously high price, then uh, we'll lose a lot of customers and there will be no ginza. And the businessman entertaining his clients in style is finding he better return to the office the next morning with more than just a handful of expense receipts. Nowadays, if we're spending a lot drinking, we're actually talking business, trying to make deals. And for those not able to deal successfully in the recession, the water trade still is a way to drown one's sorrows.
Steve Herman, Asia Business News, Tokyo.